Very good. Okay. And I want to also mention, um, in addition to all the pe people we see here, I want to mention a couple of other people, uh, very distinguished uh, mathematicians from France, Philippe Frajolet and Brigitte Vallée, and, and we have the pleasure of having them here because of the mountain in Iceland. Uh, and in case you want to, you'll wonder why it's called a mountain in Iceland, it's because that's, that's the name. So, uh, so I'm glad you, you guys are here, and we'll try to see if we can get them involved in the talk. I don't know if we'll succeed or not. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, so we're going to talk about estimating probability when the alphabet, underlying alphabet is large, and this is joint work with a lot of my students, past and present. And in particular, what we'll talk about today will be mostly about joint work with Prasad Santanam, Krishna Viswanathan, and Jun Anjan. Okay, so we'll discuss um, four problems, distribution modeling, classification, probability estimation, and compression. And we'll look at all of them from a unified viewpoint, which we call patterns, and which we'll discuss. And because these are very basic problems, then a lot of famous people have worked on them, and even some animals and some plants. <laughs> got involved and hopefully we'll have time to cover all of them. Um, actually, I understand that Brigitte gave a talk in this series like a week ago and the talk took an hour and a half. And I'm pretty sure that within an hour and a half we can cover everything, so. <laughs> all right. um, okay, so um, let's uh, start. But before we do that, I want to say that looking at all these things, you think that this could be a good talk, but it's not. <laughs> and that's because if you get a good, take a good talk, then what you do is you take things that are different and make them look the same. And show that there are same things that are complex and simplify them. Take things that are applied and build a theory around them. And take something that is boring and make it really interesting. In this talk, uh, we'll take things that are obviously the same and try to convince ourselves that they're actually different. Take things that are simple and make them very, look very complex. <laughs> Something theoretical and say, hmm, let's, we'll try to build a case that it's applied. Maybe not very strong. And because we'll talk about it for so long, then it'll become boring. And these are only the four major flaws in this talk. For, another one is that we're talking, covering four topics, as we saw. So clearly, we have no time. We go into no depth. And what are we doing wasting all this time in that case? So, OK, so, um, okay, so let's start. So, so we grew up learning that a rose by any other name would smell the same. And so science being equally beautiful should give us the same result if it's conducted in any language. Okay? So to test this hypothesis, let's look at swine flu. And let's try to estimate the fraction of cases, of swine flu cases in each country. So we want to say maybe that 20% of the cases are in, in the United States, 30% are in France, 50%, whatever, 50% in England, or so, and so on. Okay? So if Professor, Professor Spankowski was trying to estimate this, then what he would do is he would just look at the newspaper and see, OK, there's a case in Mexico, a case in the United States, a case, a case in Mexico again, Spain, and Mexico again. Okay? Um, on the other hand, if uh, Brigitte or Philippe did it, then they'll read, look at the same um, newspaper, say, they'll say, oh, Mexique, oh, états -Unis or Mexique, or Espan, or es Mexique, and, and they should get the same result. What do we mean by the same result? We mean that the probability that Professor Sponkowski will give the USA should be exactly the same as the probability that Brigitte and Philippe will give etats -Unis, United States. They should get the same answer, okay? Furthermore, we should get the same answer not only if we're conducting the research in English or in French, but also in the immortal language of mathematics. And so what we call the first country that we see, we call it number one. The second country we see, we call it number two. Then we see country one again. And then a third country, we call it number three. And then the first country again, we call it number one. Okay. So this sequence of numbers where we call the first element we saw number one, the second we saw number two, and then kept these numbers with, with those elements is what we call the pattern of the sequence. Okay. And again, we expect we should get the same answer in the math, namely we should get what? We, should ex we expect to get that the probability of two should be that the mathematician will give two will be the same as the probability we gave to the United States before. It's obvious, 
should be the same. Okay. So just to see, maybe look at some prettier animals, let's suppose we're looking at the probability, or maybe a little more applied, probability of a host winning. Um, then let's say we see that a host called Barbara won and a host called Seabiscuit won and Barbara won again and then Barbara and we want to assign the probability that Barbara will win based on this distribution sequence. Then uh, if we do it using patterns, then what is the pattern of the sequence here going to be? Barbara is going to be one and then Seabiscuit is host number two and then one one. Right? So this is the pattern. And again, we would like to think that the probability of Barbara should be the same as the probability we give one. Okay? So this is what we think is, is obviously the same. And this is what we'll try to convince ourselves is actually different. And if different, maybe better. Okay? So that's the goal, first goal. All right. Okay, so, um, so hopefully, so actually to, to just make sure that we all know what patterns mean. So what they do is we replace each symbol by its order of appearance. So here is a small quiz. If we see ABBA, A-B-B-A, what is the pattern of the letters? One, two, two, one. One, two, two, one. perfect. And slightly more compl complicated, bananas. All right, so we have one, two, three, and then two, three, and so on. One, two, three, two, three, two, four, right? And Jeopardy, one, two, one, give me a word with that pattern. Word. Lots of them. Wow, okay, or mom, or dad, or I. And, and it doesn't have to be letters, right? Even if you look at sequence of colors, red, blue, and red also has the pattern one to one. And French mathematicians, Valet, <laughs> Flageolet, and Valet also have the pattern one to one. Okay, so it could come from anything. All right, um, okay. And, and last one, one to four, give me a sequence that has that pattern. Which sequence will have pattern one to four? One to four. One to four, I would say the pattern will be one to three. Because one would be one, two and will be two, and then the, the four will be the third that you've seen. I would call it one to three. Oh, yeah. So what would have one to four? Nothing, right? Because the numbers after we see one and two, the next symbol will be the third one. So after one and two, we, only, we have to see three. Okay? So we know what, hopefully we know what patterns are. So they, what they do is they capture the frequencies, and you see they capture the frequencies of the things we see, but they ignore the symbols they set, they abstract them, okay? Yeah. Right. Okay, so, so we've described patterns, and we want to describe the, the different problems that we'll address, and, and we also saw how the animals and flowers come in, and we're now going to describe these two problems. So um, these are two problems in estimating probabilities. They're very related. In probability estimation, you try to associate a probability with the outcome. So for example, you want to say that Spain is 20% probability, Mexico is 50% probability, and the United States is 30% probability. Or that Seabiscuit wins with probability a quarter and Barbara wins with probability three quarters. Okay, that's the standard probability estimation problem. In the second problem, distribution modeling, what we'll do is we want to disassociate the probabilities from the outcomes, okay, what do we mean? So we want to just estimate the probability multiset. So for example, instead of saying the probability of Spain is 20%, Mexico 50%, and USA 30%, we just say, once had the collection of probabilities of 50%, 30%, 20%, without saying which, which country has which probability, okay? Or instead of saying that Seabiscuit wins probability a quarter and so on, we said that the, the two winning probabilities are three quarters and one quarter without saying which horse has what probability. Is this clear? Okay, so, um, so of these two problems, we'll start with the second one, that of just estimating the probability multiset. Okay, so we want to estimate the probability multiset. For example, say these are the set of probabilities. So what's the first question you should ask about this when you see that? Yeah, they have to sum to one, that's correct. They have to sum to one, hopefully here they, they would. But what would be the first question if I describe to this problem that you should ask? In my opinion, the first question should be, who cares? <laughs> if I'm going to buy a stock, if I'm go, I want to know which stock is going to go up. Or so. If I want to bet on a horse, I want to know which horse is going to, to win, right? So why should I care only about the set of probabilities without caring who has what probability, okay? All right, so let's see some reasons. 
Okay, so in a lot of applications, people want to estimate, say, the number of species or the number of different virus strains there are. So that is just the cardinality of this set. It has nothing to do with who has what probability. So that's just estimating the cardinality of the set that a lot of people work on. Or I give this talk and often people will come and ask me something about other, uh, afterwards about, about it or they'll, they'll tell me about the problem they have. And I gave a talk once and, and this guy works for um, a company that designs drugs, um, medical ones. Okay. And, um, and what they do is they want to design those drugs and, um, and they take some molecules that they know are related to, to this disease that they're looking at and they combine them and then they test them. And if it works, that's great. You know, they make a lot of money. If they don't, if they don't which is usually the case, they'll mix those chemicals again and, and try again and so on. And the question that they have is, when should they stop? When do they know that they've covered maybe 90% of the stable chemicals that they will get from this? Okay, so at some point, they start getting repetitions, but maybe they'll get a new one. So this is determined just by the probabilities of getting each one, not the probability of what, which chemical has what probability. Okay, so that's one case. Another case is if you're building like a wireless network, you're building a cell phone networks, network, and you want to know, you want to make sure that it works like 95% of the time. So you care about the probability that people call, but you don't care about the probability that Mike would call specifically or that Wojtek would call. You just care what are the probabilities people are going to make call, phone calls, okay? And in security, you care about just like the probability of different events happening, and in information, Theory we care about entropy. Again, it's not a function of the values just of this. And in general, whenever you care about statistics, that's what you care about. So the answer to the question who cares is everyone. Okay. All right. So so let's talk about this this problem. Okay. To um, get an idea about what's going on, let's imagine that there's um, you know like a landing uh, from outer space and and the first and the the visitors transmit a message and. Maybe this is the first message. It consists of 60 ats and 40 uh, pounds, okay? And, um, and we want to analyze the, the uh, statisticians because it's a silly problem, so statisticians want to analyze this, I'm sorry. Um, and, and then assuming independence, let's say, they determine, if they looked at this, what will they determine? How many alpha symbols are in, the, in this, um, in, in, in Motionese? How many, how many symbols? Two, right? Very reasonable. And what are the probabilities of, of what are the probabilities of these two symbols? Sixty percent and forty percent, right? It's very reasonable. Okay. So for our problem, we said that the multiset of probabilities is sixty and percent and forty percent. Okay. Right. Um, what methodology did did we use? Um, e either empirical frequency, saying we saw sixty percent and so on, and 40%, or maximum likelihood, which I want to describe next. Okay. So what is maximum likelihood? So we observe a sequence X, and we want to find a distribution that will maximize the probability of what we observed. So in this case, we observe 60 at and 40 pounds. So we call the probability of at P and the probability of pound 1 minus P. So the probability of the sequ sequence, because we're assuming independence, is P to the 60 times 1 minus P to the 40. Okay, And then we just need to maximize this probability, okay? So we take the derivative and so on, equate to zero, and we'll see that it's maximized by P equals 0.6. So the probability of at is 0.6, the probability of pound is 0.4, and since we don't care about the association, we said the set of probabilities is 0.6, 0.4. And you notice we'll always sort them because it doesn't matter. Okay. Now, so this, so maximum likelihood always agrees with empirical frequency, which just says how many times these different things appear. So this will be true not just for alphabet of size two, but if you s observe 20 ats and 50 pounds and 30 ats, uh, ampersands, what would the, the multiset be if you did maximum likelihood? 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 0 0.3, and we sort it to be 0 0.5, 0 0.3, 0 0.2. Is this clear? Okay. So as we can see, maximum likelihood works well when the alphabet is small. Like here, the alphabet was size two. Here, the alphabet was size three, and we had 100 samples. So a large alphabet, I'm sorry, many samples, small alphabet. That works perfectly. But as we'll see in the next slide, it works very poorly when the alphabet size is large compared to your sample size. Okay? All right. So to see that, instead of more Chinese, let's consider a similar language, more Chinese. All right. And let's say that this is the first. We go to China, and this, this is the first uh, thing we observe. So I don't know. I'm, I'm told that this is what this means. 
but apparently not. <laughs> um, okay, so, so, so we'll see, let's say we look at 100 simple symbols, most likely they'll all be distinct. And if we did sequence maximum likelihood, what will we get? What is the alphabet size in Chinese, we'll assume? Based on this sample, we'll, we'll say 100. And each symbol has what probability? 1%. This is clearly a very poor model, right? What's a better model? What would be a better model that we'll say if we see all of them being different? What would we say? Like 1,000 or 100,000 or a very large, very large alphabet, maybe even infinite. Because that would explain why when we took 100 symbols, all of them were different. Okay? So, um, okay. So let's do a thought experiment and say that we, we don't care about the association between the values and the probability. We just want the collection of probabilities. Okay? So, so because of that, we don't even need to consider these symbols that I can't even pronounce. We can just look at the pattern instead. So what is the pattern of, and instead of doing maximum likelihood on the sequence, we'll do maximum likelihood on the pattern. Okay? So what is the pattern of, of and, we, and this is what we said before, should obviously be the same. This is the difference between math and English and French and Chinese. Okay? So this should give us the same result. Okay? So what is the pattern for this sequence? One, two, three, up to 100, right? And which, which just means, this pattern just means that all the elements are different. Okay? And which distribution will maximize um, the probability of this pattern over how many elements? Uniform, Uniform over how many elements? 100. Maybe not. We were looking for the distribution that will maximize the probability that if we take 100 samples, this will be the pattern. Uniform is okay, but over how many elements? If we have a uniform over one element, we'll always get the pattern 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Uniform over two elements will get one, two, one, two, two, one, or something like that. But, yeah, you, this will be maximized by exactly what we want, by, by exactly a large this distribution of a large, possibly infinitely many elements. Because if I have a distribution of like a billion elements with very high probability, if I take 100 samples, I'll see this pattern one, two, three, up to 100. Okay? So what we see, what we see is that what we thought should, should be the same is actually different, is actually different. And also, it works better for very large alphabets like we saw, okay? And the question is, number one, why? And number two, will it work better for smaller alphabets or just for this ridiculously infinite, large, infinite alphabet? Okay, so that's what we want to see. Okay, so to see that, let's see what's the difference between sequences and patterns, okay? So, so we assume, always assume that, or always in this talk at least, assume that the sequences are generated independently. We're not changing that assumption. Sequences are generated independently and ID, in fact, identically. And, and they will induce some probability on the pattern. Okay? So we call the pattern C. So for example, one to one. And so what is the probability of a pattern, given pattern C of, for example, one to one? Is the probability of observing this pattern, which is just the probability of all outcomes whose pattern is C. Okay? So for example, if the alphabet consists of three letters, A, B, C, and for simplicity, let's assume that they have equal probability, one third, if we take one sample, what will the pattern be? One. And what will the probability of this pattern be? One. Thank you. If we take two samples, now we have two possible patterns. What are they? One, one, and one, two. And what is the probability of one, one? That's the probability that we'll observe either A, A, B, B, or C, C, right? That in all those cases, exactly those cases, we'll get the pattern one, one. What is the probability that we'll observe one of them? is three times one ninth, which is one third, okay? And this is kind of obvious because the probability of one one is exactly the probability that the second is equal to the first. And in this distribution, the probability the second will equal the first is one third. Okay. Right. What is the probability of one two? It's the probability that we'll observe one of these se sequences, what, correct? So the probability that we'll observe one of them is six over one ninth, which is two thirds. It's clear, they have to sum to one, clearly, okay? And you can see again, this is the probability of one, two is just the probability that the second is not equal to the first. And with this distribution, it's two thirds. Okay, that's the probability. Okay. So we see that patterns are not distributed ID, even though the original distribution is ID. And that's why it, math is different from English, because the first element is always one. 
So that's why these two things that we thought were the same are different. So this is what gives us a different math, and as we'll see, different results. Okay. Okay, so what we're trying to do is instead of maximizing the, the probability of the sequence, which we saw before is trivial, we want to maximize the probability of the pattern. That's what we want to do because the pattern is essentially sufficient statistic for, that pro for this problem. Okay? So given a, a pattern, for example, one, two, and three, we want to find the highest probability that the pattern can get and the probability that achieves this highest, the distribution that achieves this highest probability. Okay? That's it. That's all we want to do. So for length one, there's only one pattern, one. And what is the highest probability that this pattern can get? Clearly, one. Thank you. And, and it's achieved by which distribution? Any. Any distribution will give this pattern probability one. Length two, one, one. What is the highest probability of all distribution? What is the highest probability that one, one can get? One again. And it's achieved by which distributions? Constant. Any distribution, like for example, if the coin has heads on both sides, we'll always get heads, heads, heads. So it's achieved by constant distribution. One, two, what is the highest probability that one, two can get? I'm, I'm looking for more than, than half. What is it? Yeah, or so we would call it one. And it's achieved by which distribution? Distribution of a large alphabets, right? Like in Chinese, right? I mean, the probability that you get one, two is one, close to one. Okay. Right. Um, and similarly, probability of one, 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 the highest probability is one. The highest probability of one, two, three, again, the same is one. The first interesting one is the probability of one, one, two, which you can see because it's IID is the same as the probability of one, two, one, the same as probability of one, two, two. All of those have the same probability. And the question is, what is it? So here the problem is this. We're flipping, for example, let's just say we're pl flipping three coins and we're getting heads, heads, tails, okay? Then what is the underlying distribution, okay? So if you did sequence maximum likelihood, it will tell you what is the, what, what, what is the bias here? Sequence maximum likelihood, we know, is simple. Two thirds, one third, right? Okay, and if we do pattern maximum likelihood, the question is what we'll get there, okay? All right, so let's, let's, let's see. So we'll show that the highest probability that, that the pattern 112 can get is a quarter, okay? How do we show it? We'll show that it's at least a quarter and at most a quarter. To show that it's at least a quarter, we'll give a, a specific distribution that will give this pattern probability of a quarter, okay? So simple, um, take a fair coin, half, half, flip it three times. What is the probability that you get 112? So the probability you get one, one, two is the probability that you get either heads, heads, tails, or tails, tails, heads. And it's because it's clearly the sum of these probabilities, and each one is one eighth. So the total is a quarter. So we know now that the highest probability of one, one, two is at least a quarter because this distribution gave it probability of a quarter. And the question is whether there is another distribution that will give it a higher probability. And we'll show that there isn't any. Okay? So, so the probability of one, one, two is the summation of all possible outcomes x of the probability that x appears twice, so that's p square x, and then something other than x occurred, so p square x times one minus p of x. You agree? Summation of probability of a, a, something else, b, b, something else, c, c, something else, and so on. And you notice that this, we are not assuming that the alphabet is of size two. The alphabet can be anything. Okay, and so that's what we want to upper bound. And we can clearly separate 1 px times 1 minus px here. Okay, so we get right like that. And then p, p times 1 minus p is at most a quarter. Okay, so this is at most summation px times a quarter. And a quarter comes out. So we get that the total probability is at most a quarter, no matter what distribution, no matter what alphabet size. Is it clear? Okay, so with this we showed that while sequence maximum likelihood will tell you 2 thirds, 1 third, Pattern maximum likelihood will tell you one half, one half. And a natural question to ask is in this, we saw that patterns make more sense when the alphabet is large. This is the other extreme. The alphabet cannot be smaller than two. If we convince ourselves that pattern maximum likelihood makes more, more sense even in the smallest possible alphabet, then we're in good shape because maybe also in between. Okay. So, so question is which one would you say makes more sense? Um, you flip the coin three times, you saw heads, heads, tails, 
And now you ask, what is, you're not, we're not asking what is the probability of heads and what is the probability of tails. We're not asking that. We're just asking what is the pair of probabilities. Would you say two thirds, one third, or would you say one half, one half? I claim that you should say one half, one half, because you, you, you flip the coin three times. You cannot get one and a half heads and one and a half tails. You have to get integer numbers. numbers. The closest you can get to one, one and a half, one and a half is two and one. Any distribution other than one half, for example, two thirds, one third, will increase the, the likelihood that you'll get something appearing three times. Therefore, we'll decrease the maximum the likelihood that you get one thing appearing twice and one thing appearing once. So half-half is the most logical thing that will give you one thing appearing twice and one thing appearing once, which is what we saw here. So that's why we think that even for this case, pattern, max, pattern maximum likelihood makes more sense. Okay? But of course, I'm not asking you to be convinced based on this calculation, but what we'll show in later on. Okay? All right. So if you think that this calculation is too easy, finding the pattern maximum of one of 112, you can try 1123, but don't do it now. I can tell you that this, if you took a simpler one, 1112, it would appear in, in what's considered to be the most difficult math Olympiad problem ever. So this is 1123 is beyond that, actually. <laughs> right. Okay. So, um, okay. So uh, we have some theoretical results, but we don't have time today, so we'll discuss them manana. Uh, we have um, computation results, and again, we don't have time, so we'll discuss them as uh, Brigitte and Philippe will say, uh, quand les poules auront des dents. <laughs> that means when chicken has, have teeth. <laughs> and we have experimental results, and we'll describe them when, pigs, when the pigs fly, but that's when swine flew. <laughs> so that's now. All right. Um, so, um, okay. So we took a uniform distribution. So, so I'll describe first some, some uh, synthetic experiments. So we took a uniform distribution uh, over 500 symbols. So it's shown here in blue, a 500 symbol uniform distribution. Each of them is one over 500. And we took 350 samples. So clearly, we will not see all the elements in the alphabet. What most we'll see is 350. In this particular experiment, Two elements appeared six times, three elements appeared four times, 13 appeared three, and so on, 161 elements appeared once. So, and so the total number of elements that appeared, if you sum these numbers, 63 plus 161, so on, is 242. And 258, more than half did not appear at all, actually, in this experiment, because there are repetitions in this, okay? So if you did sequence maximum likelihood, you'll get exactly you know, the empirical frequency. Two elements appear six times, and so on, 161 appeared once, and then you'll get that you'll be missing these half the elements. So, so part, sequence maximum likelihood completely misses the uniformity of the distribution and misses more than half the elements of the distribution. Okay? But on the other hand, if you did pattern maximum likelihood, if you try to just say what will maximize the probability of the, exactly this, that two elements will appear six times, three elements will appear four times, and so on. If you did exactly pattern maximum likelihood, you'll get the green line. So you see that it, first of all, it essentially figures out that the distribution is uniform, essentially figures out that it's over 500 elements, even though it has not seen um, more than half the elements. Okay, so you may say, okay, maybe we were lucky here. Okay, so maybe this sequence is very lucky, it gives us this, this maximum likelihood. So we repeated this experiment 12 times, and here are all the experiments. We ordered them more or less by how well the uh, pattern maximum likelihood did. So here it's the best, here it's the worst. And you'll see that in all those 12 cases, which is all we tried, it's, it performs much better than, than the sequence maximum likelihood. Okay. And then if instead of take the same distribution of 500 symbols, and instead of 350 samples, take 750 samples, more samples, again, same distribution, then now maximum likelihood is closer to the original distribution, but still non-uniform and misses more than 100 elements, 120 or so elements. Okay? And if you do maximum likelihood on the pattern, you get this. And if you repeat it 12 times, you'll see that essentially all the times you'll get exactly, essentially exactly the right distribution. Okay. So these are experiments on synthetic data. And so we said, let's try it on some real data. Okay. So as you know, um, every 10 years by law, we have to have a census. Okay. And there's always a big debate as to whether they should use statistical methods or, or just send everyone an envelope and go to the house and so on. And, and which gets a little expensive, right? So do you know, like, for example, how many people are involved with the census um, this year, which is 2010? 
How many people are involved with taking the census this year? What's the guess? Yeah, close. Is 1.2 million actually are involved in hired to take the census. But you know, you may think it's bad, but you know, sometimes it's considered to be good. It's uh, you know, good for the economy. All right. Um, okay. So what we did was, I, I won't tell you the exact thing, but we tried to 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 estimate the distribution over last names. So for example, Smith is the most popular last name, or at least was in 1990, one percent, and Johnson was 0.8 percent, and so on. Okay. So. Um, so basically, according to this data that we got, so you can get from the internet, there are 19,000 last names, uh, and they cover about 230 million uh, people. Okay, so that's what's written here. Um, so this is the distribution of the last names, and what, now what we said, okay, suppose we sample, this is based on, let's say, 230 million, we'll only sample um, 35,000 people. Okay, so much smaller. Okay, so if you do that, you'll get the following distribution. This is the, sequ the sequence maximum likelihood. Okay. This is what you get if you just look to the distribution you get. So you see you're missing like about half the names. Uh, but if you did pattern maximum likelihood, you get this distribution. So this, is, this difference is how much is, is what you pay with 1.2 million people for. Right. Okay. Um, okay, so is that clear? So now once you have the distribution, you can do with it many different things. And one of, the, one of them is the first application that I mentioned, which is estimating the population. So this was started by uh, Sir Ronald Fisher, is one of the greatest uh, statisticians of all times. Um, he was interested in estimating the number of butterflies in Malaysia, Malaya, which now we call Malaysia, okay? And clearly he saw from the very beginning that maximum likelihood won't work, as we saw. And so they used, he, he was actually the one who is credited with popular, popularizing maximum likelihood. So I'm sure that's the first thing that would come to his mind. Uh, and then they came up with some assumptions like Poisson distribution, gamma prior, and so on. And, and then there were some follow-up works on estimating number of new species and so on and many others. And what I want to talk about today is estimating the vocabulary size of Shakespeare. So Shakespeare wrote about 900,000 words, of which about 28,000 are distinct. And in 1976, um, Efron and Thist had used essentially the same methodology, methodology that Good and Toulmin used um, to, to estimate the number of words that Shakespeare knew. And they said that if he wrote the same number of words, another 900,000 words, then there'll be about 11,000 new words that we have not seen before. Okay. And this paper went pretty much unnoticed until about 10 years later. Uh, there was a poem that was discovered in, I believe it was in Osc in an, at a library in Oxford. It's called Shall I Die? Here is uh, the first stanza. Um, uh, Shall I die? Shall I fly? And so on which people suspected was written by Shakespeare. Now, if they went as far as the second stanza, they would see it's impossible, because this must have been written by a scientist, because it's actually about publication. So it's, shall I tend, shall I send, shall I sue and not rue my proceedings? So, you know, it's clearly an information theorist thinking, but they didn't know. Okay, so, um, so this poem contains 429 words, of which nine are new, and so this is some of the words and so on. And so, um, again, Thistad and Efron published another paper and decided that Shakespeare write a, new, a newly discovered poem and they applied a methodology and they showed that in 429 words you expect about seven new words, okay? And which is considered to be close to nine. And so this paper got a little bit of uh, publicity after that, so, okay? So since we can estimate uh, the distribution of Shakespeare words, we can also try and calculate how many new words will be if you wrote another 429 words. And if you use that method, we can see we get 6.98. So we can see it's roughly the same. That's not the point. I'm not saying it's a little closer, but it's roughly the same. Okay? But uh, if, if you use this method of pattern maximum likelihood, you can apply it to anything. You can estimate how many words will appear five times, how many words will be, you know, will, will appear, you know, anything you can calculate once you have the distribution. In particular, I want to observe also that, you see, they answer this question of if you wrote, th this number of words here, 429, is much smaller than the total number of words that you wrote. And here, they estimated the, n the number of, that, of new words 
if you wrote the same number of the same body of work, another 900,000, and there's a reason for that, which is that if you use the method, the method will predict the number of new words for a size which is up to the size that you have seen so far. It does not work well beyond that. So to see that, let's look at the number of new symbols. So take a ZIF distribution. People consider that to be reflective of lots of different things that we see in reality. And sample 500 times. And then we estimate the number of new symbols in a sample of size lambda times 500. So 500 symbols we've seen. And we try to estimate how many new things we'll see if we have lambda times 500. So 500 times or twice that new different words. Okay? So this is, this is the actual distribution that you'll get because we know what distribution we're looking at. It's a ZIF distribution. And if you use good tool win, which is the same method that um, Thisted and Efron used, then you'll see that you can predict very well up to size one. If you go up to the same size, you can predict very well. But if you continue, if you, if, if you try to see how many words, new words, if Shakespeare wrote two million words, it will diverge. And if you do pattern maximum likelihood and then predict, and then you get this line, which is, you can see continues tracking the distribution much better. And I should mention that we don't have, we don't know that we can calculate the pattern maximum likelihood the best way possible. As I told you, 1112 is, is a math Olympiad problem. So we have only approximate ways. So it could be that if you could do it exactly, you'll get a better result. Okay, so this extends to lambda bigger than one, as we see here, and also can apply to any other prediction. Okay, so we talked about distribution modeling. And we saw how uh, Fisher and Shakespeare came in. And maybe we convinced you that what looks the same is actually different. Okay? And now we want to discuss probability estimation. Okay. So now we want to, to find the specific probabilities of elements. So instead of 0 0.5, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, we want to say that Mexico has 50%, USA is 30%, Spain, Spain is 20%. And instead of saying three quarter and quarter, we want to say Barbara wins probability three quarters and and say biscuit with probability a quarter, okay? So to get in some intuition about that, imagine that we are going to prepare for, going to go on a safari, you know the semester is ending. Everyone's thinking what they're going to do the day after. Okay, so, and let's say that we want to find the distribution of any different species that we're going to observe. So maybe we're going to go and do a little bit of Googling and we see some pictures. So for example, here there is uh, one giraffe, three zebras, and two elephants. So um, what is the probability that you'll assign to the different species that you're going to see there? So the simplest one, again, is empirical frequency, which says there are six animals altogether. So the probability of giraffes is one-sixth, elephant one-third, and zebra is one-half. Is there a problem with this estimate? What is the problem? We, may, we might not come back alive from this, right? Okay, so, um, so, so this problem has a long, so, so, and this is where simple becomes complex. Um, and this problem has a long history. Uh, it concerned the French back all the way back to the 1800s. Uh, and they were concerned about the probability that the sun will not rise the next day. So they saw, they saw that the sun um, rose, 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 but then the new one day, there could be a problem, okay? And you think that that may be a problem for the ancient, for the old world, for the French of 200 years ago, but it's actually a problem that bothers them even today. They see that there are flights, 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 but then there are no flights. So, uh, um, so the question was, what is the probability uh, that the sun will not rise, okay? And there were different estimators. Um, and the one that people remember to, today is that by Laplace. Um, and he said you should add one to everything you've seen, including to new. So if the sun rose n time, then you pretend that it rose n plus one times. And it didn't rise, luckily, zero times. So you add one, you say it didn't rise once, you pretend. And then you need to normalize this. So the probability of the rising is n plus one over n plus two. And the probability of not rising is going to be one over n plus two. Okay? So that's the Laplace estimator. Okay, so let's see what it means for the safari. So we pretend instead of one giraffe, we pretend we saw two. Instead of two elephants, we pretend three. Instead of new, zero new, we pretend that there was one new. And so now the total number is now 10 because it was six plus four. 
And so the probability of giraffes will be 2 over 10, elephants 3 over 10, and so on, and nu will be 1 over 10. Okay, so now nu has some probability. And there are many add constant variations. Instead of adding 1, you can add 1 half, and so on. Okay, so the question is whether these distributions are good. Okay. Um, so to see that, let's look at a slightly more modern experiment, DNA sequences. So suppose we want to find the distribution of DNA sequences. Now that's a very silly question, right? I mean, because it's not that there is one DNA sequence that is shared by half the population and another DNA sequence shared by a quarter of the population. Everyone has a different CNA, DNA sequence, okay? But that's exactly what we want to find out in the experiment. So we, to do that, we take a large number of samples in, okay? And clearly we'll see that all of them are different. So if we use Laplace estimate, what will we get? We get that for each observed sample, we'll give it, it will appear once, we'll get it, give it a count of two. And new, by definition, is zero time, we'll give it a, a count of one. And now we need to make a distribution out of it. So we observe this n times and this one, so the denominator is two n plus one. The probability of each observed sequence is two over two n plus one. The probability of new is one over two n plus one. And the question is, is this estimator good? You took a million samples, and you're saying this is your distribution. Would you say it's good? I would not say it's good, because that after I took a, a million samples, and I saw all of them are different, this will tell me that the probability that the next one will be different will be one over two million. It's co co clearly illogical. The probability the next one being different should be one, close to one. Okay, so, it's, so, so the probability of new here is close to zero, but in fact, and the probability of observed is that times n, so it's 2n over 2n plus 1, which is roughly 1. In fact, the opposite is what we should be saying. Okay? So while Laplace works well for small alphabets, it doesn't work well for large alphabets, which is fine, because Laplace was not worried about this case. It was worried about rise, not rise. But, but, but if you try to extend it that, that way to large alphabet, it will not work. Okay? So, um, so, so this was the problem that was faced by Good and Turing. So let's say what it was. Um, so this is during World War II. Um, there was a small war going on, and, and there were like uh, uh, um, about 3,600 vessels that were sunk during that time. Uh, these are Allied Forces vessels. So we can figure it's about three a day. So, so it was a ma major problem. Um, and, um, and the main culprit were the U-boats, the, the German submarines called U-boats. There were about 1,000 of them. And the Germans communicated to, with them using the Enigma cipher, okay? And, um, and there was a major effort trying to decipher the, the, this code. It was, a, was centered in Bletchley Park. And amongst the things they did was they built the first computer. It was called the Colossus. And, but it was clearly a very rudimentary computer, so they also had 12,000 people actually working on that. And what they were trying to do is they were trying to observe some statistical clues um, that will help them resolve things, okay? And one thing that helped them was that they captured the gem German book of keys. So the Germans did not allow the commanders to just choose any key, because they knew they'd choose like the wife, one third of the time, the girlfriend, two thirds of the time. So they, they gave them a book of keys, um, and, and they had to choose from that. So the book had many pages and many lines and many columns per line and so on. And, um, and, the, and, and this book was captured, actually, by the British. So they had previous decryptions, and, and they tried to estimate the distribution that each commander will choose, like from the beginning of the book, the end of the book, the top of the page, the bottom of the page, and so on. And so you see, it's, the number of pages is much bigger than the number of samples that they had, the number of previous decryptions. So it's the, the case of a large alphabet problem. Okay, so. Um, I don't know if we have much time for this, but uh, for the, describing the, the estimator, but um, we'll take the, we can take the Brigitte uh, time. Sure. Okay, all right. okay, so to describe the Laplace estimator, uh, we needed just three species to describe good Turing estimator. We need um, uh, Noah's Ark. Uh, so let's imagine that you saw one giraffe, one rhino, two elephants, two lions, two cheetahs, two jackals, and so on, three zebras, and so on. So what does, so if you look, at, if you use empirical frequency, then the probability you give each species is proportional to the number of times it was seen. Okay, so um, giraffe is, will give a probability which is proportional to one. 
elephants probability proportional to two and so on, normalized by 90, not, not important. Um, if you use Laplace, the probability is proportional to the number of you have seen plus one. So, in, so giraffes will be now proportional to two, elephants proportional to three, normalized by 29. Okay. And good in Turing, what they do is they, they start with Laplace, okay, but then they tweak it. How they tweak it is, um, it's funny. They multiply by the number of animals appearing once more than what you have seen and divide by the number of animals appearing the same number of times. So, uh, for example, you've seen, we've seen two, two species appeared once, four species appeared twice, and three species appeared three times. So if we try to estimate the probability of giraffes, we'll take two from Laplace, and then these are giraffes, and then we'll multiply by four and divide by two. We get four. To estimate the probability of elephants, we'll take Laplace, which is three. Elephants are here. We'll multiply by three, divide by four. Get 2.25. Need to make it into a distribution, divide by 19. Okay? So this is the good Turing estimator. Is there a problem here? Clearly there is. Right, what probability will we give zebras, right? Zebras appeared uh, three times. Try to estimate the probability, Laplace would say four, and then we'll multiply by how many, how many species appeared four times, which is zero. So these will get probability of zero, okay? Which is, the, again, the opposite of what we would like. The, the thing that appeared the most, we give them zero probability, okay? But that's a problem for people like us. It's not a problem for uh, good or for Turing. Um, they realize that what you need to do is smooth these numbers, and then there are many, many ways of smoothing, get a family of estimators and so on. Okay, so, um, so some observations. Good Turing is surprising and complex. Surprising because why do we need to tweak it by this number? It doesn't a priori make sense. And complex because some of the, some of the smoothing techniques are complicated. And yet it works well for infrequent elements, things that appear a few times. So it's used in applications where you see things that appear a few times, like language. You have words that are very unlikely and so on. And machine translation, data mining. Okay? It is suboptimal for frequent elements. Um, uh, so if, so if, if something appeared half the time, then clearly nothing appeared more than it. So if you see something appearing half the time, you're not going to use good Turing. You just say, okay, the probability is one half. So there are some modifications, for example, empirical for frequent elements, empirical frequency for frequent elements, and good Turing for infrequent elements, and so on. And there are many others. There are actually papers and books written about this, including this one, good Turing frequency without tears, and so on. And um, there were several motivations for this, and by motivation I mean not proofs, but something that say why you'd even want to do something like that. It's not a proof that says if you do it, it's optimal, we get this result, so on, but just like why it makes sense to modify things like that. So the first one was given by, by Good himself. He published the work in 1953. It's about seven years after the war, or eight, so when the work was declassified. And in his paper, he writes that the formula was suggested to him along with an intuitive demonstration by Turing but he doesn't say what was the explanation was given by Turing. He does give some explanation, which may or may not be the same. But, um, so this is one, and there were some other explanations by Robbins and by Jelinek and Mercer and so on. Um, rigorous proofs started in, the, in 2000, McAllister and Shapiro, and then we had our approach in 2003, and then this is Druk and Mansour, and this is Wagner, uh, Kulkarni, and Viswanath in 07. Um, so what is the plan for the 10 minutes we have left? <laughs> uh, so we're going to describe, actually we're not going to, a measure of, because we don't have time, a measure for estimate, evaluating estimator, which we estimate, which we call attenuation, and actually I'll skip that because of lack of time. But if people want to stay, so what's a good plan? We can, we can do that. It will take us about 10 minutes past the time, or you sure? Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So, um, Okay, so measure for e evaluating estimate, which we call attenuation, and we'll evaluate empirical frequency, Laplace and good Turing, and then we'll show how hardin romanusian can help us, or at least mention that. And using, using hardin romanusian we get optimal estimators. Okay, so what is attenuation? So there's an underlying distribution P, which is unknown, 
and we observe a sequence X, and we want to assign to the sequence some probability Q. Q is, P is the actual distribution, which we don't know. P, sorry. Q is the, the probability that we assign, okay? And we want Q to be close to P, okay? Now, what do we mean by close? In our case, we want Q to be almost as high as P, so we don't want to underestimate probabilities of things. Okay. Now, you can ask why we don't want to underestimate, why aren't we wonder about worried about overestimating? Why are we only worried about underestimating? We'll talk about that soon, after we give the definition. So formally, um, the ratio, P, the probability of X over Q of X, that's the actual probability, that's our probability, that's by how much we attenuate, how much we underestimate the probability of X. And we're going to be very conservative and we're going to look at the worst attenuation of all distribution of all sequences, so we're being super conservative. And this is the attenuation for the whole sequence. We're going to take the nth root, so we're seeing by how much we underestimate each symbol as we go along. Okay, that's the nth root, and then we see what happens when the number of symbols increases, and we call that the attenuation of the estimator. So the attenuation is the asymptotic per symbol, because of the nth root, worst case of all possible sequences, attenuation. Or in other words, it's the largest factor of underestimation per symbol. Okay. So, some observations, in the worst case, we under, by definition, we underestimate by the fact this factor FQ, each symbol, okay? So we want low attenuation. We don't want to underestimate. Now, because P and Q, P is a probability distribution, by definition, Q has to be a probability distribution. We cannot give everything probability one. It's not fair. We have to give also a probability distribution. So Q is also a probability distribution. So they both integrate to one. So there will be some values for which Q, our probability, is less than P. Like here in this range, Q is less than P. And therefore, the attenuation is at least one. So the best we can hope for is attenuation which equals to one. That means we don't underestimate. Now, if the attenuation is strictly bigger than one, then it means that we underestimate each symbol by a factor that is bigger than one, and we underestimate the whole sequence by this exponential factor. If the attenuation is, is one, that means that we underestimate each symbol by a factor that goes to one, and we underestimate the whole sequence sub-exponentially, not two to the n, but something which is less than an exponent. So that's the question. Can we underestimate the sequence sub-exponentially? Right. Um, okay, so now why are we looking at attenuation? So first of all, if you can show that the attenuation is one, that means that you don't underestimate, and if you're going on safari, if you're going to a war in Iraq, if you're doing a bunch of other things, it's an important factor, right? To not underestimate if you're trying to fly back to France. Um, you don't want to underestimate some problems. Okay. Also, because both P and Q are probabilities, if you don't, they integrate to one. So if you don't underestimate, that also means in some sense, roughly speaking, it means you cannot overestimate. Because if you overestimate someplace, you have to underestimate someplace. And we don't underestimate. Okay? So this argument here. Also, if you it is easy to show that if you don't underestimate, then the most common distance between distribution people use is KL divergence, kulbeck leibler and you can show that it will go to zero. And there's a bound that uses KL divergence on the L1 distance, so it will show that the L1 distance also goes to zero. And that would imply that LP for any P bigger than one, any, any distance for, is, is going to go to zero. So we see that attenuation is much stronger than it, than it appears. It's also very simple, and equally importantly, we can show that you can get attenuation, which is one. Okay? So let's see what, empirical, what the different methods do. Empirical frequency, as we saw, assigns to new probability of zero, but new in general will have some positive probability, so the ratio between P over Q, over Q, P is going to be positive in general. So the ratio is going to be infinite, and it's a non-starter. There's nothing you can do. Laplace. You can, if you look at DNA sequences, then the probability of new, as we saw, is 1 over 2n minus 1. So the probability to give a sequence of length n is this product, 1 over, th 1, over 1 times 3 times 5 times 7. But the highest probability of new, new, new is 1, if you look at DNA sequences. So the attenuation is, is just this product. And if you take the nth root, it will also go to infinity. So now you need to do a little bit of calculation, but you can also show it's infinity. It's simple. Okay? Good Turing, as we said, the different versions, so we consider three versions, and in all of them, the attenuation was not infinity, 
but more, at least a posit like bigger than one. So that means that the sequence attenuation will be exponential. Um, so how do you get diminishing attenuation? So using results by Hardy and Ramanujan, we can show that you can actually design an estimator whose probability is two to the square root of n. Remember what we're trying to do is get an estimator whose attenuation is sub-exponential, not two to the n, not 1.1 to the n, so we're getting two to the square root of n. Because it's sub-exponential, when you take the nth root, you get two to the one over square root of n, which will go to one. Okay? And this bound is uniform for any alphabet size, <coughs> no matter what the alphabet size is. And, but there's a small problem with this estimator, which is it requires two to the square root of n operations per symbol. So we have also an efficient algorithm whose, whose attenuation is a little higher, is two to the n to the two thirds, but still sub-exponential, so it still converges to one, the attenuation. And this can be done sequentially and with a constant number of operations per symbol. Okay. So how do we do that? So using Hardin and Ramanujan work on the partitions. So a partition of n uh, is a collection of positive integers that end to, end to n. And pn is the number of partitions of n. So for example, one, we can write just as one. Two, we, so its partition number is one. Two, we can write either as two or one plus one. So the partition number of two is two. Three, we can write in di three different ways. Its partition number is three. Four, we can write as the first interesting one. We can write as five in five different ways. So its partition number is five. And the question is, what is p of n in general? It's the partition number of n. So this question already occupied the Greeks, um, and Euler actually developed generating functions partly to address this problem. Um, and this problem remained open until uh, early in the, in the uh, 20th century, where Hardy and Ramanujan uh, derived some formula which showed that the partition numbers was roughly two to the square root of n. And they thought that this formula was approximate. Okay, so we have some of the world's experts here on generating functions uh, in the first row. Um, and so um, they know a lot more than, about this than I do. And they thought this formula was approximate, but there was um, a retired um, British major, Major McMahon, and he calculated <coughs> the partition number up to 200. And you can see that if it's two to the square root of 200, square root of 200 is let's say 13, give or take. So two to the 13 is 8,000. You can see if you're retired, if there's no internet, you can do that. And he did that and he saw that, that, that the formula was exact up to that point and then what they did was uh, they went back and they realized that the formula was precise. Okay. Um, and it's called by, we mentioned this book uh, by Wilf, it's called one of the jewels of 20th century analysis. Okay. And there are plays about this and so on. Okay, so um, I, I, we don't have time to describe, um, um, to describe what's the connection, but we have time for a test, okay? Um, so let's see, so suppose you've seen A, 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 like the sun rose, 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 rose. What is the probability that you'll say that you'll get something new? If you tell me the probability of new, then the rest will be just the probability of A. So what's the probability you'll see something else? Would you say it's close, I'm not asking for the precise value. Would you say it's close to one, close to a half, close to zero? The sun rose a billion times. The probability of you, that it will not rise is close to what? Zero, okay? So the estimator agrees with you. It says it will go to zero like one over n. Suppose you've taken a thousand samples and you see two values, each appearing half. So by symmetry, if you tell me the probability of new, then I know everything because I subtract that, divide by two, I'll get the probability of a and b. So I flip the coin a thousand times. 500 times I got heads. 500 times I got tails. What is the probability that it will fall on the side? Roughly? Zero, okay, and you agree with the estimator. Okay. Now you see all the symbols different. Many samples, all of them are different. What is the probability that you, they will be new? You go to China, all the characters that you see are different. What's the probability that the next one will be new? Roughly? One. Very good, okay. So at this point, it's like the, you know, like the click and clack, you know, the, the radio show, the, the, the car guys say so we've wasted a perfectly good hour of your time. Because we got something that you could tell me, not just you know, now, but probably when you're in kindergarten, right? Um, so, but you notice that all these answers were either zero or one. Let's see when they're not zero or one, so. Okay, so suppose 
that we take a thousand samples and instead of seeing 500, two symbols each appearing 500 times, we see the opposite. We see 500 di different symbols each appearing twice. So now it's a case of large alphabet. Large but not trivial. This, these two were very small alphabet. This was large alphabet, but very trivial. Now it's a case of large alphabet, but not trivial. So to, I took 1,000 samples. I've seen 500 different symbols, each appearing twice. And we're assuming it's IID. I'm telling you it's IID. My question to you is, what is the probability that the next one will new? If you tell me that, then by symmetry, I can solve everything, right? The rest will be 1 minus this probability divided by 500. So 1,000 samples, 500 different things, each appearing twice. What is the probability the next one will be new? What would you say? Just guess, I mean, in the interest of uh, going home. Uh, what would be, I'm oh, sorry? I don't know. I mean, like, I've, I've seen 1,000 samples and, and 500 different things each appearing twice. You would say it's close to? One half. One half. Why? Um, because that was our guess, too. Because every other time in this 1,000 samples that I took, 500 times I saw new things. 500 times I saw all things I've seen before. So about one every other time I saw something new. So reasonable guess is one half. If you do that, you will not get a good estimator. Okay. So our estimator does something which is a little funny. Let's first say what it is. After an even number of times, like here, after six times, it will say that the probability of new is about a quarter. So now it will say probability the next one will be something else, something not ABC, is, is about a quarter. After an odd number of times, so for example, after A, A, B, B, C, it will say that the probability of new is close to zero, which in this case is correct if you look at it. But, because there's A, A, B, B, C, C, but that's an artifact. Let's not worry about it. The interesting thing is that in both cases, it's less than a half. So it thinks that the probability is less than a quarter. Why? We don't know exactly, but one somewhat of an explanation is, is the following. If you, if you look at this and you say, I've taken 1,000 samples and I've seen 500 symbols each appearing twice, you can ask yourself, what is the most likely alphabet that underlies this process? And if you did the math, it's not difficult. You'll see, most likely, you have a distribution of 620 elements. That will best explain why, if you take 500 elements, you'll only see, you'll see, if you took 1,000 samples, I apologize, you'll see 500 elements. If you only had 500 elements in distribution, you, some of them will not appear. Okay? So 620 elements is what will explain it the best. Of these 620, you have seen 500. So the 120 that you have not seen, and take the ratio, the probability is 120 divided by 620 is roughly 0.2. So that's kind of a little bit of an explanation. Okay? Right. So with that, we have covered the second problem, and we saw how Laplace, Good, Turing, Hardy, and Ramanujan came in. And we're left with two problems, two, two topics. Um, and, uh, oh, and we saw what simple is actually complex, right? We get into Good, Turing, and so on. Uh, we're left with two problems. Uh, I'm very hesitant about keeping people here, so I, I would suggest if we want, we can stop, and then if anyone wants to... Oh, it looks like we have to invite you again. Yeah, I'm <laughs> always happy, but make sure it's not in the winter and not in the summer. And <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, maybe we can just stop here, and, and you, don't, you, you, don't, you don't know why it's interesting so becomes boring and so on. But we'll come later. Yeah, okay. So we, we can, I think two out of four is not bad.